Well, here I'm here with John Hansen, uh, bodybuilder. He's a uh, been a bodybuilder since he was 14 years old, like in t history. He's also my bodybuilding coach, which is a really cool aspect of this conversation. So I'm talking to him as a fan of his, uh, him as a bodybuilder, but also a, a student of his as a coach. So we're going to go into all, all sorts of things around mindset, his career, and how what he's up to now and how he's helping people uh, really just transform themselves, their bodies, and their physique. So, John, great to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me, Barton. Great to be and here. I love that you. I love that you've got some of the photos behind you. Uh, for those yeah. of you listening in audio, uh, he has been on the cover of Iron Man magazine, Muscle Physique, uh, and things like that. He's written for Iron Man magazine for many years uh, in the 2000s, and so he's got really a vast uh, connection with the entire bodybuilding world. But it's really made his mark in natural bodybuilding. So, uh, but before we get into the the professional ranks and what you did in the natural natural bodybuilding, let's go back to when you were a kid. Okay. Right. And I feel like so many people, especially guys and guys from, I mean, I'm a little bit younger than you, but not that much. Like there's that eight seventies, eighties where we're growing up and there's these movies coming out with these incredible movie stars and all that kind of stuff. So talk about how that, that kind of the, the world that you were growing up in really impacted why you got into bodybuilding. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause when I started bodybuilding in 1976, 1977, um, the world was much different then than it is now. I mean, people weren't into physical fitness as much. They weren't working out as much. You, very, you really saw a guy walking around who had a muscular physique. It was very rare. You know, gyms were, uh, they had the big health clubs, but then they also had the, the smaller hardcore gyms, and that's where all the bodybuilders and powerlifters went. And it was kind of a, just a smaller group of the population. It was like a cult almost. And they were very serious about it, but it wasn't well known to the general public. So when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about bodybuilding. I didn't know anything like bodybuilding existed. My first introduction to anyone who had muscles was the comic book superheroes I read. Because I, I was a big, avid comic book reader when I was a kid. And I, uh, I really got into it. I started collecting the magazine or collecting the comic books. And, and I really loved the way these superheroes looked. And I think that was my initial interest in bodybuilding. Of course, none of the superheroes worked out with weights, except for Batman, I think. <laughs> All the other ones just, they put on their costumes and they had muscular physiques. But uh, I was really interested in that, that look of the muscular body. And then the first guy I saw, the, real, the first real person I saw who had muscles was Bruce Lee. And I was at a car show. And this must have been only shortly after he died, because he died in 1973. And they had the Batmobile car from the Batmobile TV or the Batman TV show, and uh, that's why I went. That's why I wanted to go. I told my dad I wanted to go, so we brought the whole family out there. And they also had the car from the Green Hornet, which was the Black Beauty. That was the name of his car. And uh, they had a poster of Bruce Lee, and it said, "In Memoriam, 1940 to 1973, Bruce Lee." And I never, I didn't watch the Green Hornet, so I didn't know who Bruce Lee was. But it was a picture of him from Enter the Dragon, and he had his shirt off, and he was ripped. And I was immediately, like, so impressed with this guy. I'm like, who is this guy? He looks like a real-life superhero. So because it was around the time of his death, there was a lot of books and magazines about him, about his life. So I became a Bruce Lee fanatic. I kind of forgot about the comic books, and now I got totally into Bruce Lee. And I started following his exercise routine and did exactly what he did. And one of the things he did, in addition to all the martial arts and the stretching and the running and the calisthenics, he also did weight training for power. He was way ahead of his time. He realized even back then that if he did weight training, he would have more power in his martial arts. And it also would develop his physique, which looked great in his movies. Um, so then I asked my parents for a weightlifting set for Christmas. And then when I got it, it came with a uh, 10, like 10 exercise pullout of exercises you could do with the weights. So I started doing those for like six months and then I wanted to do more. So that's when I went to a health food store and I found the bodybuilding magazines and that was my initial interest in bodybuilding. So that's where I first got into it. Well, I, I, there's something interesting. Like I, I think certain people are like, they gravitate towards like physical strength, physical fitness, the aesthetic look of like being a superhero looking really strong. Like, do you have any idea, maybe just perspective looking back, you know, from where you are now, like 
Why do you think that resonated with you um, versus like any other person who might just be like, oh, I don't have the time for that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of bodybuilders are shy when they get into bodybuilding. And if you look at bodybuilding, it's the ultimate expression of expressing yourself. You know, I mean, you're building your body out, outwards. You know, you're building your muscles. So a bodybuilder can go anywhere and he is expressing himself to everyone without even saying anything, just walking around because he's got this muscular physique. So a bodybuilder who is totally unknown in another country can go there and people will notice him. Or if it's a baseball player or a soccer player even, if they don't know that sport out there, he's just another person. But bodybuilders stand out wherever they are. So I think because I was kind of shy, I was looking for a way to get out, to break out. And this was my way to break out, was to build up my physique and show everybody, hey, look at me, look at me, you know, without even, like even building even my personality. I didn't have to build my personality, it was just my physique. And I was expressing myself through building my physique. So I think maybe that's what it was. I was looking, I remember when I got into bodybuilding, I was really wondering about my life. I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I think I was like 12 years old. And then I, that, that's probably weird to be thinking at that age. But I wasn't even thinking about high school or college. I was like, what am I going to do? What's my purpose? Where do, who am I going to be? Who am I? And then when I discovered what bodybuilding was, it was like, that's it. That's it. Like, I knew exactly that's it. It was like, that's it. I didn't know anything about the sport. I didn't know anything about steroids or the competitions or the politics. But I said, I am going to be a bodybuilder. That's it. And it was like, I knew before I even went into high school what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I remember a lot of kids that I would talk to, they were kind of envious of that. They're like, wow, you already know like what you're going to do with your life. But I had a, my life's purpose all set out. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I didn't know if I had the genetics for it. I didn't even know if I could be good at it, but I just was so convinced that I was absolutely in love with this and this is what I wanted to do. Well, it's, you know, the fact that you're 12, 13 years old, you start training, like, you know, so much of, of bodybuilding is the time you put in. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. people talk about like, okay, does he have the genetics, or, you know, or the, the muscle bellies or that, but it, so much of bodybuilding is, putting in the work, you know, mm -hmm. and if you can start the earlier you start, the more like mature muscle you can develop, uh, you know, the, really the better chance you have at really being successful early on. So, yeah. yeah and that's a really, I, I love your point on that. Like you know, I hadn't, I hadn't heard it explained that way. I mean, I, I, I think I had similar reasons for, for like looking into like bodybuilding. Like I had the magazines. I, I remember going around in junior high school, like showing picture people, <laughs> picture of Vic Richards, like, this yeah. like massive dude, like, dude, yeah. look at Vic Richards. And everyone's like, Ooh, put that away. Oh man. Like, you know, but it's like, you almost realize in that moment, like that, Hey, you know, I'm different. I, you know, this, this, me, this resonates with me and it doesn't yeah. resonate with a lot of other people. And that's okay. And yeah. I, my buddy, my buddy, Tony, who was real skinny, we're both basketball players. We just like got obsessed, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and it, it's, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, it's, I think it's special, I, you know, I've listened to Mike O'Hearn talk about his like finding bodybuilding and, and powerlifting mm -hmm. really early nine, 10, 11 years old, his brothers and sisters. And, yeah. and here he is, you know, about your age, right? Mike's probably 55, 56 and still doing it right. Still doing it. And, and I think, yeah. is he? Yeah. But I mean, I think that's just such a, you don't hear a lot about that because a, a lot of people burn out or they get injured or they've. They take so many steroids, you know, during their early twenties and thirties that their body just really can't handle the longevity yeah. of the sport. And so I think there's a there's a special place for someone like yourself who's you know in his fifties and have been doing it literally your whole life and made it an entire career and and yeah. uh, kind of built out this entire life for yourself. Uh, talk about those early days. You start working out and uh, just the first, maybe take me back to the first competition or kind of what you remember of that, like excitement and nerves around like mm -hmm. competing at that, you know, in those early days. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I, I have a, a, as you know, I have a podcast uh, called bodybuilding legends and I talk to a lot of the guys who were legendary bodybuilders and I talked to a lot of them who were genetic freaks, you know, and once they started bodybuilding, like they grew right away. And a lot of them won their very first contest, their, their very first few contests they went in. 
Um, so it was really easy for them. I wasn't like that. I had a very thin body and uh, I was skinny. And I was doubting myself uh, right off the beginning, you know, like I'm reading all these magazines and I'm seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger and Franco Colombo and Lou Ferrigno, Mike Menser, Robbie Robinson. And I'm like, oh, my God, these guys look like they're from another universe. I don't <laughs> I don't even resemble these guys at all. How am I ever going right. to develop my body like theirs? So I remember I worked out at home for a year and I went from 135 pounds to 155 pounds. And uh, after training for a year, I took some pictures in front of my family's fireplace because we had good lighting. You know, we had that overhead lighting. <laughs> so my brother took some pictures of me. And when I got him back, I was really pleasantly surprised at how my body looked because I could see I had, a lot, I had a long way to go. I was only 155 pounds. I had a long way to go as far as building my muscle mass. But I did have the structure. I had the, the bone structure. I had wide shoulders. Uh, I had a peak on my bicep. I could see where the muscles were attached, like my lats were really attached low. My chest was like long and wide. So there was no muscle there or there was, I needed more muscle, but I could see I had the basic framework and that gave me a lot of confidence. And then I believed in myself then. I believed that I could eventually make it and develop the kind of body that I wanted to develop. And of course, Arnold was my idol. So I would compare my pictures to Arnold and coincidentally, it was kind of weird because my body structure was sort of similar to Arnold and the muscle shapes were similar to Arnold. We had like the same strong points, the same weak, weak points. So he was the perfect idol for me to pick because he, he looked a lot or I looked similar to him. So when I was building up and I was going through this journey, I was always, always, always looking at pictures of Arnold. I had so many books about Arnold and so many magazines. And if there was a a magazine that had good pictures of him. I had to have that magazine. And I would just stare at these pictures forever, you know, just looking at his body. And then I found out, and then it was weird because when I got into my 20s and I was competing, and a lot of the pictures, my body looks like his. My physique looked like his. And a lot of people would say, man, you could look like Arnold. And it was kind of weird how it all worked out because he was my first idol. And it was weird that my body kind of looked like his. But um, getting back to your question about the first contest, um, I did my first show when I was 16. I don't know how I found out about it. It was a teenage contest. It was called the Teenage Chicagoland. I had never, I had seen contests before, but I had never obviously been in a contest. So I didn't know, we didn't have coaches back then. We didn't have, uh, like everybody's got a contest prep coach now. Everybody's got coaches for everything now, but we had no coaches. I don't think there was personal trainers back then. So you were pretty much on your own. And um, I remember reading in the entry form, it said no oil. It was an AAU contest. This was before the MPC started. And uh, so I thought oh, no oil meant no tan, <laughs> no tanning stuff, you know. So yeah. the contest was in December in Chicago. I go in completely white, no color at all. And they held the prejudging for the contest at a gym. It was Midwest Fitness Center. They moved the equipment out of this one part of the gym and we stood against the wall and the judges sat on folding chairs right in front of us. And there was like, I think there was like uh, maybe 20 teenagers in the contest. It was a teenage Chicago and there was a short class and a tall class. I think there was about 12 or 13 guys in my class. And I think I got sixth place in my first show. So uh, they would call us out if we were standing right in front of the judges and uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of knew what the poses were, but I was really a novice. And then I remember one of the judges said, uh, let's see their hamstrings. And uh, one judge turns to the other one and he goes, they don't have any hamstrings. <laughs> 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 so then we did, went to the night show and the night show was at a, a high school. And uh, you know, then I did my posing routine and stuff. And uh, I was just blown away by some of the competitors, how big they were. You know, I mean, the guys who were 19, the guys who took like first, second, third, they were huge to me. I was 16. I was like a kid. And yeah. so it was really motivational for me. And I ended up competing in nine more teenage contests. I was so like psyched up that that was my motivation for the next three years uh, was I was always looking for another teenage show. And I was probably doing like three or four shows a year as a teenager. Um, just because I was motivated by the competition, you know? Well, and, you know, I think the, the, the fascinating thing about 
bodybuilding and just the process of it is like you've got to get really lean for these yeah. shows, but then you've got to build muscle and kind of fix your yeah. weak points and start to kind of like develop. And so like talk about that, not necessarily in your teens, but like how you understand it now, kind of help the listener understand kind of that, that process of like leaning out and then development yeah. uh, and then, and then going for the next show. Yeah. Well, as a teenager, it was really a great learning experience doing all those shows because every time we went to a show, my brother would take pictures of me and then I would analyze the pictures after the contest. And I was able to see like what weak body parts I had and what strong body parts I had much more so than if I was just working out at the gym and looking at myself in the mirror. When you're up on stage and you only have posing trunks on and you're doing all these required poses, the mandatory poses, which are designed for the judges to see your weak points, right? They want to see where you're weak. So they're looking at poses of you with your arms up, with your arms down from the side, from the back, you know. So they're looking at you in all different positions. And I had my weak points and I had some strong points. So every show that I would go in, I would look at the pictures and I would see if my strong points were get, or my weak points were getting better, if I was improving the symmetry of my physique or the proportions of my physique. And I also became a really good poser because I was doing contest after contest after contest and I was practicing and I would practice the posing in between, you know, but when I was getting ready for a show, we would practice our routine uh, for like eight weeks. I mean, I practiced my routine for eight weeks. I would pick out a song and then I'd practice like an hour a day, five days a week. So I was really good. And my brother was an art student. He was studying art in, in high school and then he went on to college and that's what he does now for a living. So that was the greatest uh, coach I could have had when it came to posing because he would look at me and he was looking at my body from an aesthetic point of view. And he was, even though he did nothing about bodybuilding, he didn't work out himself, he could look at my body and say, oh no, turn your wrist this way or put your foot back a little bit here. And he could see from his aesthetic point of view, you know, the proportions and how this looks better and that looks better. So I became a, a really good uh, poser thanks to him because we were able to analyze my physique and figure out the best angles and stuff. But yeah, the whole process of competing, that's it. Like you said, it's like you bulk up, you get bigger in the off season, you improve your body, then you come down, you lean down and get ready for the contest. And then you see what you've got left when there's no body fat left. You look at the pictures, you analyze it and you say, how can I improve? And then the next one you put, you train for the next show, whether it's three months away or a year away, and you say, okay, this is what I want to do. And I have to improve this part. I have to improve this part. And then you design your training program to improve that. So it's a never ending process because we're never satisfied with our bodies. You know, uh, Mr. Olympia, Chris Dickerson called it a wonderful sickness. He said, you never, <laughs> you never can, you're never satisfied, you know, but right. it, it's, and we, it's we're really always going to find the weak points, you know, like our eyes are going to go always, to our, yeah, like, yeah. oh my gosh, those hamstrings are terrible. Oh, geez. Right. Oh, that. I, I could see a picture of myself in peak condition and I'll go, oh, that looks terrible. And everybody else thinks <laughs> it's great, but I'm finding the one thing that looks bad, you know, right. the one little right. part. Yeah. No, I, and that's, so just on, on that point, like as a coach, what do you recommend that, that period of between shows be optimally? Like if, I mean, I think there's probably somebody like Milos Sarsev. He's, he did what, like 65 shows in, in, yeah. in just would do a show like 10 shows a year and right. he's a freak of nature. But for most people, you just that can't that's so hard on the body, so hard on the system. Yeah. And it's hard to improve in between yes. shows. What do you recommend? Like, let's say someone does a show uh, like what would be the kind of ideal if you were coaching them time that they should like build, improve, gain weight and then cut back down for another show? I think a year, I think a year in between shows is the best. Um, when I stopped competing as a teenager and I was competing in my twenties, that's what I was doing. I would train all year for one show and sometimes it would be two shows or even three shows, but they were all close together. They weren't. So you might like, year. you might do like, I'm doing a show in April. So I might do like a couple of shows around that time. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, to kind of like, Hit, hit it and maybe one the weekend that of my first show i'm not perfect but that like exactly. but yeah. the next week i really like things kind of come together a little bit better and right. then once you've kind of done that then you start going back into that improvement season and yes okay yeah, exactly. that makes sense yeah yeah because yeah, the dieting takes so much out of you like you said it's you have to diet you have to get rid of all that body fat and it's a real process and it'll take anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks so when you're done with that 
I mean, obviously during that time, you're not going to be building any muscle because you're, you're bringing the body fat down, so you have to lower your calories. The best you can hope for is that you're going to hold on to that muscle while you're doing it. But then when you see what the finished product is, then you have to look at it, assess it, and say, okay, I need more legs, I need more triceps, I need whatever. And then you build on that for the next year. So um, it's always a good feeling when you go into a contest after a whole year of preparation. You know, you've worked hard for a whole year. Like I know you, yeah. Barton, you've, we've been working together and you're doing a great off season. And I think that's really important before you do your, you know, before you compete and do a contest. So that way, you know, when you go into that contest, after you've dieted down, you know, you did everything possible to improve your physique, not just the dieting part, but also the building part. You know, you worked hard. It wasn't like just, oh, this is my off season. There really is no off season. There's always an on season. They, 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 now they call it an improvement season. You know, that's what the coaches at Pro Physique <laughs> yeah. are calling it. So there's the improvement season and then there's peaking for the contest. Yeah. So uh, I, th I think that's a great term to use because there really is no off season. You're not like taking it easy. You're building your body, actively building your body during that off season, eating the right amount of food, building, enough, you know, eating enough calories to build the muscle, but also training in a specific way to put that work in. And then when you diet down for the contest, then that's another area of preparation. Um, not so much the building, but just getting ready for the contest. So I think, yeah, I think a year is a good, good time period to do that. Yeah. Let me ask you kind of coach to coach. If you're working with a non bodybuilder and so many people like they want to lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time. Yeah. And a lot of people will tell you they can do it. You know, like, Oh, you work with me 90 days transformation, all this, but like, unless somebody's on steroids, that's a totally different animal altogether. But like if someone's naturally working out like and trying to drop 20, 30 pounds of body fat, and gain muscle like what what do you know about that like what's the reality of that situation and, and what would you advise somebody in that situation well it really depends on their training experience um it is a really hard or even impossible thing to build muscle while you're losing fat but if i am dealing with a client that has never worked out with weights or they haven't worked out with weights in let's say five years um once they start working out with weights, their muscles are going to grow because now you're putting stress on the muscles and they're going to respond. So even if their diet, if their cal caloric intake is a little below maintenance, is which is what you need to lose fat, they're still going to build muscle. And I've worked with a lot of clients, even guys in their 50s uh, or even 60s that haven't worked out for a while. Once they start working out with weights, their muscles get bigger. And their body weight isn't going down as much, but I can see their body changing. I could see the, the muscles from the pictures they're sending me. I could see they're adding muscle. And I can also see from the measurements that their waist is going down. And if we do like arm measurements or chest measurements, those measurements are going up. So there's no doubt about it. They're definitely putting on muscle as they're losing fat. But as you become more experienced, like someone like me who's been training my whole life, it's going to be really hard for me to add muscle as I'm losing fat because I'm so used to training and I'm training hard all the time that my body's used to that. So uh, that would be a difficult thing. But yeah, I, it is possible yeah. to uh, change your body composition like that, especially if you're someone new to training. Yeah, that's a great point. I think uh, yeah, they say like in the first year and a half is like of, of training is when you get like 85% of like, you know, of your of your you'll get your quickest gains in those first like yeah. year and a half to two years and then it's yeah. then it's a you eke out gains for the rest of your life yeah. after that yeah, it's, it's great training as a beginner because it's like every week you're getting stronger you're constantly yeah. adding muscles so it's it's a great uh, great time so talk about talk about bodybuilding as you kind of you, know, you fell in love with bodybuilding for just like the, the aesthetic of it you went to a show not knowing anything about anything you're showing up mm -hmm. pale white no tan um, but as you start learning about the, the world of bodybuilding and, and what it takes to be a pro, obviously you're, you're introduced to steroids and kind of that, the reality of that, like talk about that in the early eighties when you start going into like more of the, at, at that in the twenties and your pro becoming a pro and that kind of stuff and, and what you learned about it. Yeah, I, I really learned about steroids reading the magazines. Uh, that's when I was, when I first heard about them. And at first I was confused. I didn't understand like what steroids were or who took them or how they took them or what they did. And I remember when I was like 15, there was an interview with Arnold in one of the magazines and uh, the uh, interviewer asked him if he, if Arnold took steroids and he said, yeah, he did use them for competition. But Arnold said that uh, the steroids are always temporary. So any gains you get from them 
don't last. They, you go, they go away once you get off the drugs. And then he even said in there, he made a point like to uh, younger bodybuilders, and he said, you should not use steroids to build up your physique because you build a drug body, and then the gains will go away once you stop using the drugs. So he said, you should build your body with hard training and good nutrition. And so I, that resonated with me. And then he said that all the top guys took them. So he said everybody at the Mr. Universe or Mr. Olympia level, and he downplayed it. He said, I think they only add like 5% to your physique. You know, you know, he, he, he totally yeah. like uh, downplayed how, how sure. effective they he, are. He, he's, he's quite a communicator when it comes to uh, yeah. selling the public on. <laughs> right, right. He is. But he said without that 5 or 10%, he would lose the contest. So he had to take them because he was a champion. And like anybody who's a champion, you have to take risk. And I think he equated it to like a race car driver going 200 miles from an hour on a track. He's taking a risk and Arnold was taking a risk. So, um, but the, what I got out of it was that the top guys take them that I would probably need to take them if I ever get to that level. But at my age, I was 15. I said, I don't need them. Obviously I don't want a temporary physique. I want to be a bodybuilder for the rest of my life. So I'm going to work hard and take, you know, train hard, eat good and do whatever I can to develop my physique naturally. However long that takes, because then it's going to be my physique. It's not a result of drug use. And as I started going to the hardcore gyms, when I stopped uh, training at home and I got my driver's license and I started going to a gym, I would see guys in the gym make miraculous changes, you know, in like three months. And then they would get off the drugs and they would go right back down. In fact, sometimes, you know, how the gyms were back then where everybody was busting each other's balls. We'd like see this guy come in and like, what happened to you? <laughs> what, what, what are you skinny or what happened? You look like you lost 30 pounds. And the guy would get so embarrassed he'd leave and he wouldn't come back until he was, <laughs> until he was on another cycle, you know? So I saw how these guys would go up and down. So when I was competing as a teenager, I was totally natural and I was competing against teenagers who weren't natural. And that was hard to take, you know, uh, it was hard losing to these guys, but, um, I just was doing it for the long term. I said, I have to develop my physique naturally. So it's my muscles, it's my body, and it's not the result of drug usage. It's going to go away, you know, once they get off the cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, for a lot of people that the aspect of the sport that, that is steroids and all the other things, you know, I mean, people from the outside in there, it, people just think steroids, but you know, if you're inside yeah. the sport, you know that there's insulin growth factor and gro growth hormone and all these other things. A lot of, a yeah. yeah. uh, lot of other things that are being used, especially, uh, as they got more, you know, intricate in the nineties and such. But, uh, yeah, but that being said, go ahead. Involved every, it gets more involved every decade. You know, I mean, I started right. in the seventies and the drug usage from then compared to now is just, it seems like it keeps growing, you know? Right. Right. I think I, I remember, I think it was, um, I think it was Ronnie Coleman said, if Arnold had the drugs that we had in the seventies, yeah. he would have been the, the biggest, you know, yeah. like he, he was so impressed with Arnold because of what he was able to do without all the drugs yeah. that they had in the nineties. And yeah. I thought like, what a great thing to say. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's true, it's true. I mean, Arnold was such a freak. I, I'm, yeah. I'm collecting all these old bodybuilding magazines now because I'm working on a book about the history of bodybuilding. And I'm, I'm looking back at a lot of these old magazines and I'm looking at the magazines when Arnold first came on the scene and mm -hmm. right from the beginning, I mean, right off the bat, people were saying, this guy's going to be the greatest bodybuilder ever. He's the biggest guy. You've got to see this guy to believe it. You know, they were just all over themselves with how incredible Arnold looked. So he really stood out during that time. And when you think about what they were taking during that time and the small amounts, it's amazing the kind of physique he developed and how far ahead he was of everybody else, you know? Well, one thing that people probably don't under often understand is like everybody's different. Like Ar mm -hmm. Arnold clearly had one of those body types. He could handle a lot of volume. Like yeah. they were working for working out four hours a day, you know, six, seven days a week. And then we'd just go eat a lot and come back to the gym. And, you know, it's like, and a lot of bodies can't handle that. They just, they right. break down. They don't, they can't build with that much stress. Yeah. And so I think, you know, back then everyone was just trying to keep up with Arnold. It was yeah. probably almost like this, like the more he would work out and grow, everyone was trying to keep up and that would just kind of almost probably break them. Yeah. Cause a lot of people right. just, I mean, nowadays, a, 
you know, as a coach, you, you're probably, you know, sometimes you're telling, probably telling your athletes, Hey, less, a little bit less. You're doing too yeah. much volume. Like, we don't need 35 sets of bicep curls. Like yeah. <laughs> let's pull it back. Let's, yeah. let's get quality over quantity, you know, but I, we didn't, they didn't know that back then in the seventies, it was just like, do more, do more, do more. Yeah. And I think yeah. that worked for Arnold and some of the other, you know, big guys back then. But a lot of people, their bodies just like went the other way. Yeah, yeah, you make a good point because when you talk about genetics for bodybuilding, there's different aspects of genetics. There's your bone structure, there's how fast your muscles grow. You know, some people are just natural freaks and they grow really quickly, others are slower. But there's also, like you said, there's recuperation. People recuperate differently. And then your metabolisms are different. Some people are very lean uh, all the time and getting lean for them, getting ripped is, is very easy. So that's an advantage if they're gonna compete compared to someone who's like maybe a more of an endomorph and, and has a hard time getting lean. Uh, and there's also the drug aspect. You know, we talk about steroids, but not everybody responds to uh, steroids the, fast, the, the same way. We, we know there's like fast responders, what they call, or hyper responders. And there's guys who take a cycle of steroids and just blow up. And then there's others who take the same amount and they don't have the same response. And I think Arnold had both the great genetics, he had the work ethic, he had incredible recuperative abilities because he was able to, like you said, train six days a week, twice a day when he's getting ready for a contest, high volume, and he was able to grow from that. And he also responded really well to the steroids. Once he started taking the steroids, he, his body blew up. And I think a good example of that is in 1975 when they made the movie Pumping Iron, which we've all seen a million times. But right before that movie, he made a movie called Stay Hungry which they filmed in Alabama in the spring of 1975 and Jeff Bridges and Sally Field were in that movie. And it was Arnold's kind of big break into Hollywood. And he had the third, the third lead in the movie. So it was a really big, big thing for him. And the director told him he didn't want him to be 240 pounds. He wanted him to go down to 210 pounds because he was going to be acting next to Sally Field. And when you're up on the screen, your body's much bigger anyways. You're, 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 you look much bigger because you're on this 10 foot screen. So he, had, he said, he goes, what do you want me to weigh? And he says, I want you to lose 30 pounds. I want you to weigh 210. So he was 210 in the movie. Obviously, he wasn't on any steroids. And once he got done with that movie, he had to start training for the Mr. Olympia. He had three months. So he went from 210 to Mr. Olympia shape. And if you look on the internet, you'll see pictures of Arnold from Stay Hungry to Pumping Iron. And it's unbelievable how much he changed in just three months, you know. Right, um, it, like he was like two thirty. Was he about two thirty five at on the at on the Olympia stage? Is that? I think he was actually right? two twenty five, but he was probably like two thirty, uh, maybe right before that. You know, before cutting right. down. Yeah. Yeah. So like to and just for my listeners, like that's you, you know you can't blame that on just doing steroids. Like you, right. No, like if if anybody could just take steroids work out and they would have that type of, of growth they would, everyone would do it that's ridiculous right, like right. that's unheard of like it doesn't plus, matter plus what he was getting he was getting the body back that he already had you know he had right had so it is a there's a year. yeah he was actually even smaller than he was the year before when he was training all year mm -hmm. so uh, but it, but it just goes to show you how quickly uh, he yeah. responded to steroids i talked to people that were in the gym that summer and watched him and they said Every week he was growing. <laughs> every every time he came into the gym, he looked bigger. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hey, we could spend the entire episode talking about old Arnold stories. Yeah. I mean, literally, there's so there's so many great ones. Uh, I remember as a kid, I read the un like the unauthorized biography of Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was called yeah. Arnold, and yeah. it was unauthorized, which I, that I thought meant it was more real because they went into steroid use and some yeah. of the like not as you know the stories that maybe t t talk about his personality his character in a nice yeah. slightly yeah. uh you know maybe more realistic set setting yeah. but uh but let's go back because you know there's the mindset that it takes obviously the patience that the body you know people think oh you know these people work out in the gym and they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger but you're like for for most of us and it sounds like you included with me it's it just takes so much more time to grow and develop and get the physique you want than you would ever wish. It's, yeah. it's 10 times longer to really get that, especially naturally. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the patience that, that you, you have and you've had kind of in this sport to really like do the work, knowing that the, that the, the results are going to come, but there's a lot slower than you probably will want them to. 
Yeah, well, if you go back to like when I was a teenager, um, when I was competing in all those teenage shows, I had a training partner at the time who was about five or six years older than me. He was probably in his early 20s. And uh, he was training with me, and I, he would go with me to every contest. And I remember after one contest, he told me, he said, man, he goes, I, I, it breaks my heart to watch you go through this, John. He goes, you're never going to win these contests because you're not taking the stuff that these guys are taking. You're natural, and these guys are on drugs. And he goes, I don't care how hard you work or how hard you diet, you're not going to beat these guys. So then he was taking steroids just as a recreational steroid user. <laughs> and there was a lot of guys in the gym who, who if they want to get big, they would take drugs. It was no big deal back then. You know, it was legal, I guess. Um, you're supposed to get it with a doctor's prescription, but there was a doctor uh, not too far away from the gym where you could go in and just tell him you wanted to get bigger and he would give you a prescription. But um, he said, I'll get you the drugs for the next contest. And he goes, I guarantee you'll win. He goes, uh, you don't even have to pay me for them. I'll, I'll buy them. I just want to do this for you because he goes, I know how much you're putting into this. And he goes, like I said, he, it, breaks his, it was breaking his heart to watch me go through this. And I told him, I said, no. I said, I'm not going to do it. I said, I... I have to develop my body naturally. You know, I said, I'd rather be Mr. America than teenage Mr. America. I said, this, these teenage shows, everybody's going to forget about after a year or so. So it doesn't really matter if you win them or not. Um, I hated to lose, too, because I was putting everything into it. But uh, I didn't want to take them at that time when my body wasn't completely developed yet, you know. So then when I stopped competing as a teenager, I needed to bulk up. Because I had been competing for so many years, um, for three years straight, I had been dieting all the time, and I had been holding back my gains. I needed more muscle mass. I needed bigger size. And then now that I wasn't a teenager anymore, I was going to go into the open competitions where these guys were really big. So I knew I needed to really work on developing size and developing my physique. So I remember within the first six months from my last teenage show going into the next year, my body gained like 30 pounds because it was like, it was just, I think it was just ready to grow. You know, I was been dieting for so long. Now, finally, I was off the diet. I was 20 years old and I got up to 205 pounds. It was the first time I was over 200 pounds. I think when I competed in the teenage shows, I was about 170. And then maybe I was 180 in between the teenage shows. So this was the first time now I've been over 200 pounds and I'm like, wow, I'm on my way. You know, I'm going to be like 230 in no time. And then my body kind of got stuck, and it just didn't grow anymore. So for eight months, I was stuck at 205. And I was training right. I was only training four days a week. I was getting plenty of recuperation. I was sleeping. I was eating a lot of food. I was eating all good bodybuilding food. And I'm like, what the hell? Why can't I grow? And so at, these guys from the gym again were like, well, go on steroids, man. You wanted to wait until you were out of your teenage. Now you're not a teenager anymore, so go on steroids. And I said, no, no, no. I, I got to do this naturally. So then I went out and bought a book called The Nutrition Almanac because we didn't have the internet back then. So The Nutrition Almanac was this really thick book and it listed all the foods and it listed the calories, the carbs, the protein, the fats, the vitamins that were in each food. And I figured out what I was eating. I wrote it all down and I figured it out with this book, what my calorie count was. And I said, okay, I got to increase my calories because obviously I'm in a maintenance because I'm not gaining so I've got to increase my calories. So I drastically increased my calories and I was eating like close to 6,000 calories or no, 5,000 calories a day, 4,500 to 5,000 calories a day. And I was almost force feeding myself to get that food in. And it was all clean food. It was all food I made from home. It wasn't restaurant food. It wasn't McDonald's. And eventually my weight started to go up. You know, I got up to 210 then 215. And by that summer, by the end of the summer, I was 230. So I had increased my body weight from 135 pounds when I started at 14 years old to being now 230 at 21 years old. So I had gained almost 100 pounds. And this was a guy, you know, I was a guy who wasn't naturally muscular. I was really thin. So when people say you can't get big without steroids, I know that's not right because I wasn't a genetic freak and I did it. It was just hard work. It took seven years. And a lot of those years were spent, like I said, competing as in the teenage show. So I was kind of holding myself back, but I was able to do it with the workouts and with the diet, even though I had to really push myself to get there. Well, two things that I took from that, first of all, is, you know, just understanding the science behind nutrition. And like, if you're not growing, if you're not getting gaining weight or getting stronger, like it may not be that you're not working out enough. In fact, a lot of times it's not like, and you talked about four days a week, 
Mm-hmm. I think a you know if somebody just listened to this listening to the podcast just said what four days what about six <laughs> days like right uh, so we'll, I want to I want to talk about four days a week versus six or seven in just a second but talk about like the really just the scientific concept of like hey you need to gain muscle you need to gain weight eat more food like yeah. how how important and simple is that fact right right yeah because it was like I was almost force feeding myself like I said to grow. Because my body just would not grow. I mean, for that eight-month period, I, I was stuck. It was either between 204 and 206. It wouldn't move. And I'm like, I'm doing everything right. So I'm like, everybody, everybody's different. You know, everybody's body is different, and everybody's going to require a different amount of calories. So then I just had to figure out what those calories were for me and then just do it, you know, just push myself. I was going to eat to the point where I was going to grow no matter what. It was like a no – it was no – no choice. My body had no choice. I was going to push it to where, you know, it was going to grow. And then with the four days a week, like when I first started training when I was 14, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so actually, I read the book Pumping Iron, which was written by Charles Gaines. And uh, in the book, they were talking about Arnold getting ready for the 1973 Mr. Olympia. And they said he trained six days a week, twice a day. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So that, that's what I was doing when I was 14. I was yep. training twice a day. Six days a week, I would get up early before school, and I would work out in the morning in our, at our house in the back room, and then I would eat breakfast, go to school, and come home, and once I got, came home from school, I'd eat again and work out again. So I was training twice a day, six days a week, and I was actually getting bigger from that, but then I read uh, Muscle Builder Magazine, and Arnold said, oh, no, no, I don't train like that all the time. I only train like that when I'm getting ready for a show. Normally, I only train four days a week, and I'm like, oh, okay. So that's yeah. when I switched it to four well, days and a week. And Arnold used to use, he used to work out instead of cardio. Like he yeah. used to do like bench and then pull ups in between and then abs. Like yeah. he would do a bunch of working out to, for, to burn calories so he could lose weight. And yeah. so people misunderstood that as like, oh, that's what he does to get big. When, what, when he made that point that you just said, like that was yeah. him getting ready for a show. He just didn't want to go out and jog or ride a bike. Yeah, well, guys didn't do cardio back then. I mean, no. I remember the gym I was working out in the 80s. We had one life cycle at the front of the gym, and that was it. Yeah. it was, that was the cardio. It was, there was no cardio equipment at all. I think sometimes no. guys would go running, but mostly mm-hmm. we were training more. We were doing more sets. Sometimes we would train twice a day, and when you do that, you're burning a tremendous amount of calories. So we burned our calories in the gym, not doing cardio. Yeah. Well, I think, too, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in myself and I notice with a lot of people in terms of the, their mindset and, and, and I, I always try to help shift it, but it's very hard to do is this idea that, you know, I want to build muscle, but I also want to look good at the same time. And so, yeah. you know, when you went from 200, eat, 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 eat to 230, that's a fluffier 230. That's not sure. a like ripped six pack 230. No. No. That's, that's muscle and fat. The body is getting bigger. The body is getting stronger. The muscles are growing. But right. also there's a little bit of a layer of fat that happens, and that's part of the process. And, and I, you know, I keep, pe- people are like, you know, I see these really lean guys in the gym, and I'm friends with everybody in the gym because I'm just that type of person, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I just walk up, and there's this one guy. He's super lean, and he's always doing the same stuff, and he's got a shoulder thing because he just won't. He just, you know, it's like you can just see he's trying to do everything right, yeah. but he's not like he's clearly just not eating enough food to get stronger, and so his body's just kind of stressed out. Yeah. And I'm just like, you should probably work out a little bit less. <laughs> what do you think? But anyway, and my point is, is like, talk about the four days a week. You've done a great job at, at getting me down to the four days a week. Because when we started training, I was, I was like, six is good. You're like, okay, maybe five. <laughs> right. So talk about that why, the why behind the recovery of four days a week and all that. Well, your body grows when you're recuperating. You know, it doesn't grow while you're training. And I think that's something that the people who train six or seven days a week, they don't understand. They think the more they're tearing down the muscle, the more they're going to build. But your body has to recuperate in order to grow. So you actually do need, like I would say, at least two days off a week where you're doing nothing. You're doing no weight training because when you do weight training, if you're training hard and you're training heavy, you're stressing your central nervous system as well as the muscle tissues. It's not like, well, I'm doing a different body part every week, every day, so it doesn't matter. I'm not overtraining. But you're training your body as a whole every time you go to the gym. So... 
if you do a heavy leg workout and you're doing squats or leg presses or whatever exercise you're doing, the legs are a big muscle group. That's a big strain on your whole system. And we've all had those workouts where after the workout's over, I mean, the next day you feel wiped out. So if you got to go in the gym the next day and work out, you're not only probably not going to give that workout 100%, but you're also going to be tearing down more of your system, of your body, of your recuperative abilities, you know, while you're in the gym again training. So that's why I think you need at least two days a week. So what I usually do is I'll train two, maybe three days a week and then take a day off, complete day off. I might, I might do cardio on that day if I'm trying to lose weight, but I won't, I won't weight train. And then when I come back to the gym the next day after that day off, I feel much better. If I tried to push it for six days in a row, I think gradually every day my, my energy output would be less and less and less because I'm pushing so hard. So you need to step back and recuperate in order to give 100% at the gym. And so that's why, now when I was bulking up during that phase, I did put on a lot of body fat, but I also put on a lot of muscle. So even though I was adding body fat because of I was eating so many calories, I was also putting inches on my chest, my shoulders, my arms, my legs, my calves, because I was training so hard and I was using more weight. In fact, I looked at it like, okay, if I'm gonna eat this many calories, it's my duty when I go to the gym that I push myself and train harder. You know, if I used 210 last week, I got to go up to 220 this week because I'm taking in all these calories. I'm taking in all these carbs. I should be able to work out harder. I should be able to move more weight. I should be stronger. So I kept pushing, pushing, pushing to as long as the calories were up, my workouts had to keep going up in intensity and in weight, or I just had to keep pushing it more and more. And, um, I think, you know, and I did bulk up. I mean, my nickname at the gym was Sumo that summer. <laughs> so I didn't even really look like a bodybuilder. I looked more like a, uh, a football player or a power lifter. But also, I have to mention too, Barton, that was when I was 20 years old, 21 years old. My metabolism was much different. So even though I right. put on weight and I bulked up, it's not the same as when you get in your 40s and 50s. Now, if you try doing that in your 40s and 50s, you're going to put on more fat than muscle, and it's really not worth it. I think it's good to have an off season and a pre contest season, or even if you're not competing, just a season where you're growing and then a season where you're coming down to look leaner, um, which is kind of what I do now because I'm no longer competing and I'm in my fifties, but I don't like necessarily bulk up on purpose anymore because it's just, it, you, you put on too much fat because your metabolism changes, your hormone levels change as you get older. It's not the same body now in my fifties that it was in my twenties, you know. That's a solid point. Being twenty years old, all the all the hormones of a twenty yeah, year old, yeah. you got a lot of energy behind you to yeah. to to change your body. So, you know, you you competed in you know open bodybuilding where you know with with uh, people that are you know all types of you know people trying to become pros and all that. You became a pro. Uh, but at some point you decided, you know, to, to go the nat, you know, to actually compete in natural bodybuilding. Talk about that decision you made to do that. And, and then, and then getting to like the 1998, uh, Mr. Mr. Olympia. Yeah, well, I was, I actually wasn't a pro, uh, with the MPC. I tried to, um, I okay. competed in the MPC for five years. And during that time I did use steroids, uh, 12 weeks before a competition. Uh, because I knew that time was going to come eventually, you know, when I was a teenager and I was building all my size naturally when I was going through that bulking up period. I knew that when I stepped back into competition and I was competing in the open competitions, uh, the, the MPC had come around by then. And my goal was to win Mr. Universe. That was my goal ever since I started was I wanted to win Mr. Universe. So by the time I went back into competition in 1985, the MPC had started a couple years earlier. And the way you turned pro back then was you had to go to the MPC Nationals and you had to win your weight class. There was four weight classes. There was lightweight, middleweight, light, heavy, heavy. Once you won your weight class, you went over to the Mr. Universe as part of the American team. All the weight class winners would go to the Mr. Universe. And then you had to win the Mr. Universe. If you didn't win the Mr. Universe, you had to go back to the MPC Nationals the next year and try to win your class again and try wow. to go to Mr. Universe again. Yeah, that was, it was really, really tough to turn pro back then. So my plan was I was going to do this for five years. I was going to use the drugs 12 weeks out from the contest. Um, because I was already big, I didn't need to use the more dangerous drugs 
uh, that were more risky and had more side effects. I was using the more mild ones that were just basically going to hold on to my muscle while I was dieting for the competition because that's what I found out when I was competing as a teenager. When I would go into the teenage contest, if I came in really ripped, I was a little too skinny and I would get beat by a guy, probably on drugs, who was bigger than me and more ripped. If I tried to come in bigger, then I wasn't ripped enough. I couldn't do both. I couldn't get them both. But the, uh, also, I didn't really know as much about diet then as I do now. Mm -hmm. But uh, back then, I thought, you know, I can't do both. I'm not going to beat these guys. If I couldn't win Teenage Mr. Chicago, I'm sure not going to win Mr. Universe being natural, you know, competing against other guys who are using the drugs. So uh, my plan was I would do a state title. I wanted to win like Mr. Illinois, then a regional title, then go to the junior nationals, then the nationals, and then the Mr. Universe. I gave myself five years to do it. I was 22 years old at the time. And by the time I was 27, I had to achieve my goal because I didn't want to be one of these guys for 15, 20 years, taking drugs every year, trying to make it. I figured, I figured I'm either going to make it or I'm not going to make it. And I didn't know anything about natural bodybuilding back then because natural bodybuilding was very small. It wasn't organized like it is now. They didn't have the different organizations where they had a pro, pro division for the naturals. Um, you might, there might be like one or two natural shows around the country, but you never really heard about them. They weren't organized. And so I figured this was the only way for me to go if I want to be a bodybuilder. So I started competing in 85 and I did win the Mr. Illinois, the MPC national or the MPC Illinois championships. I won that in 86. And then I won a couple other regional level shows, but I never made it past the regional level. When I went to the national level, I was getting killed. I was five foot eight, 205 pounds. And I was going in the heavyweight class against guys like 220, 230, and I just couldn't get past it. And this was the junior nationals. This wasn't even the nationals. So after, uh, I'll, I'll never forget the show that really turned me around was I did the 1989 junior nationals. It was probably the best show I ever looked at in that period, in that five-year period. And I was talking to a girl from our gym, and she was a female bodybuilder. And we were standing there at the check-in, and she goes, man, I can't wait to get on stage. She goes, I look way better than last year. And she goes, uh, I, I increased my Anivar this year. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> I go, how many Anivar are you taking? And these were like little, little pills. They were two and a half milligrams each. She goes, I'm taking 12. And I'm thinking, I'm taking 12. She's a lightweight woman. I'm a heavyweight man. <laughs> what are the heavyweight men taking? <laughs> So I said, so then I talked yeah. to a few people afterwards and they're like, John, you're never going to make it doing it like this. You're being too conservative. You're going to have to yeah. take more stuff. You're going to have to take it in the off season. I know you don't want to take it all year, but you're going to have to cycle on and off like everybody else is doing. You're going to have to play the game like everybody else. And I just said, no, I'm not going to do it. So then I just dropped out. I wasn't going to compete anymore. And then the year later, I found out about these natural shows because they were starting to get bigger around the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And I did my first one in 1991. So what, you know, obviously natural show means you're not on steroids, but like what, what are some of the qualifications for like being, entering a natural show? You know, I, I'm sure that the rules are a little different now than they yeah. were back in the nineties, but like take, take me through that process. Yeah. At the time in the eighties, I was a, a judge with the MPC in Chicago where I grew up and I was judging pretty much all the shows. And one of the bigger shows they had was this contest called the MPC Natural Illinois. It was an MPC show. It was natural. And it was a big show. Like, he, there was back then, they only had men and women's bodybuilding. And this promoter had, like, over 100 competitors, which is, like, what they were bringing in for the national level shows. Yeah. And it was really well produced. I remember he added a hotel in downtown Chicago. And there was, like, a lot of local celebrities would come, like, from the TV stations and sports stars. And it was a really cool show. And uh, I asked him one year, I said, man, yeah, I go, you put on a great show. I go, what do you have to do to be qualified for natural? And he said, you have to be 12 months drug free. I said, oh, okay, I'll do it next year because I was not competing anymore. Yeah. So I competed in the show the next year and I got second place. And that was more because I just missed time my diet because uh, I was not used to dieting naturally after doing, you know, being on the drugs the last five years for competitions. So, uh, the next year I learned from my mistake and I improved it. And then I won that contest the next year. And then that was the year I found out about the natural Mr. Universe, 
which I didn't even know they had a contest called Natural Mr. Universe, and it was a different organization. It wasn't the MPC. So I called that promoter up and I said, what do I have to do to compete in your Natural Mr. Universe show? And he said, you have to win the overall at one of our contests. So they had a contest in San Francisco. So it was about a month before the Natural Universe. So I went and did that one. That was the Natural North America, and I won the whole contest. And then the next, I trained another four weeks, and I did the Natural Universe, and I won that on my first try. And then I just stayed in that organization for the next, probably the next 15 years, 12, 15 years. And then after I won the Natural Universe, which was my goal, I kind of changed my my outlook and I said, well, now I just want to see how far I can push it. How big can I get on stage as a natural bodybuilder? Can I get bigger than I was when I was taking the drugs? Can I yeah. weigh more? Can I be more ripped? And then I really got into the science of it and I started really like figuring out my off season and figuring out my pre-contest and looking at my contest photos and figuring out how to get ready for the show the last week before the show. And I really started getting into the whole science of bodybuilding, you know, the, the nutrition part of it, the training part of it, obviously the competition part of it. And then I won the natural universe again, four years later in 1996. And I weighed 10 pounds heavier than I did the first time. The first time I won wow. in 92, I weighed 198. In, in 2006, 19, no, I'm sorry, not 2006, 1996, I weighed 208. So I was 10 pounds heavier. And then I won the natural Olympia two years after that. I think I was about 204 because I was a little bit more ripped for that one. And I mean, I know that the Mr. Universe was always kind of like the bucket list. Like when you were a kid, yeah. you're like, I'm going to win Mr. Universe. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference for our listeners between Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia for somebody who wouldn't know? Well, in the, in the IFBB, they created the Mr. Olympia as like the premier contest. So um, if you go back in the history of bodybuilding, the Mr. America was the biggest contest in, this con in America. And uh, that started in 1939. So every year, all the top amateur bodybuilders in the country would go to the Mr. America contest. The Mr. Universe actually started in London in the NABBA organization, N-A-B-B-A, and that started in 1948, 1950. Um, so that was the contest that everybody went to to try to win the Mr. Universe. When Joe and Ben Weider started the IFBB in, I think, the 50s, they wanted to compete with the, with the big organizations like the AAU and the NABBA. So they created their own Mr. America contest, the IFBB Mr. America, and they created their Mr. Universe, the IFBB Mr. Universe, but they were much smaller than the more established ones. So then in uh, 1965, Joe Weider said, I'm going to create a contest, a new contest called the Mr. Olympia, and this will be eligible only for bodybuilders who have already won the Mr. Universe or the Mr. World. So you already have to be a world champion before you can even enter it. Mm -hmm. And unlike the Mr. America, which had a rule that said once you win it once, you can't win it again. The Mr. Olympia was open every year to even uh, previous winners. So you could win it as many times as you want just to prove that you were the best bodybuilder in the world. So when the IFBB Mr. Olympia started, um, they only had like, I think, three competitors. And the first, if you look at like the first five years they held that contest, it was only a handful of competitors. It wasn't really the big show that it is now. Yeah. But eventually over time, it did get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the Mr. America, the AAU Mr. America, kind of faded away. It went away. And then the NABA Mr. Universe faded away. So now the Mr. Olympia, which has been going on since 1965, is regarded as the premier biggest contest in the world. If you win Mr. Olympia, you are the best bodybuilder in the world. And so with the natural end of it, they created the Mr. Natural Mr. Universe, which is like an international contest. It's open to people all over the world. So mm -hmm. depending on how big the federation is, they're, they're going to invite as many people from around the world as they can. But the Natural Olympia was kind of based off of the real Mr. Olympia, the IFBB Mr. Olympia. And they wanted that to be the premier contest for natural bodybuilding. And when they first started it in 1998, I had a, I couldn't believe that they were able to call it the Natural Mr. Olympia because I know Joe Weider, as a businessman that he is, had a patent on that title. But somehow yeah. they were able to figure it out because they put the word natural in front of it. Right. So they called it the Natural Mr. Olympia. So now in the INBA, the International Natural Bodybuilders Association, that is their biggest title. 
And again, it's an international contest and they have a professional division, which they didn't have in the, oh, I'm sorry, they did have that in the beginning. But when I first went into natural bodybuilding, the professional end of it wasn't developed yet, but now it is. Now they have a professional uh, natural Mr. Olympia and an amateur. And uh, it, in that organization, at least, it is the biggest title for them. So as we're kind of talking about the history of bodybuilding, I, I love asking bodybuilders this question is, uh, who's your top five? Like male open bodybuilding. We're, we're not talking classic physique. We're not talking board yeah. shorts. We're talking like open bodybuilding, the history. Like who's your top five? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, I'd still say Arnold is number one. Um, and then Sergio Oliva and Lee Haney. And, um, I, I guess you got to go with Ronnie Coleman because his physique was unbelievable, even though he's not like a classic, uh, bodybuilder back in the day. Um, wow. Who else? I mean, Frank Zane was great, but I wouldn't put him in the top five. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who I put up there in the top five position. He caught me on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you, you got four great ones. I mean, Sergio Olivia, I think, you know, people, people kind of forget about him. I mean, yeah. he was one of the biggest dudes ever yeah. Yeah. in like 1967, 68, like yeah. pre Arnold, Arnold kind of dethroned him, but but really, like he was, I mean, he was just a freak of nature before anybody knew anything about. I mean, yeah. you know, that kind of Larry Scott era yeah. of bodybuilding. Yeah. I don't, I mean, yeah, he there's had, not he that probably, many photos of him either. He probably had the greatest genetics of anybody, even today, because he had such a freakishly small waist. That's what made him different. And he had so much muscle everywhere on his body. If you look at, like, even Arnold, who's regarded as the best by many people. Even he had weak points, but Sergio had no weak points. He had everything. He had forearms, he had calves, he had legs. I mean, he had huge legs for back in the 60s where a lot of bodybuilders didn't have big legs. He had a big yeah. chest, big back, traps, shoulders, everything. And then he had this super tiny waist. So once he put all that together, it was just unbelievable to see. Like when you saw him in person, you were like, <laughs> you know, especially for back then, he's like, your eyes couldn't believe what you were seeing. So, yeah. um, he was a hard worker too, but Arnold always beat him because Arnold came in more cut. And yeah, I think that old. that seemed to be kind of the the one like a weak point was it like just yeah he couldn't quite get that the the vascularity or the cutness that he his, his genetics were so good that he would grow on eating like hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> and coke and, you know, he never really had a diet yeah. contest. I don't know what he did to diet, but I know he didn't diet like everybody else did. Yeah. So, um, for a few years there, when he was still growing, he came in with a physique that was really ripped and big. And I think then he was unbeatable, but as mm -hmm. he kept getting bigger and bigger, he just kept growing and growing. Uh, that's when he was coming in smoother and Arnold would kind of play mind games with him, And then Arnold would beat him on the posing and on, uh, coming in more ripped. Yeah. And that, that's actually perfect segue to my, my final question. There's a, you know, you've been in, in a lot of bodybuilding shows and I obviously yeah. so much of the, the mental work is done. You can't show up to a show unconditioned or not very big and have any chance of winning. So you got to do all the work to get yourself to the show, be yeah. lean, you got to get everything, you know, got to get the, the tan, right. And all that yeah. stuff. But once you're on stage, there's like, there's still a 1% mental game that's happening there in, yeah. in, so talk about like when you won Mr. Universe, Mr. Natural Universe, Mr. Natural Olympia, talk about some of the things that you mentally were doing in those like performance moments that kind of helped you win or helped kind of get the judges to like see you and understand there's our, there's our guy right there. Yeah, that, that's such a great question. And a lot of people don't look at that, but I mean, when you look at bodybuilding, what it is, it's, you know, you develop your body in the gym and then you get up on stage and that's a whole different that's a whole different other part of it. You know, it's, it's really the only sport where what you do to prepare for the contest is different than what you do in the contest. You know, in the contest, you're up on stage posing, but you're presenting yourself without any words. It's just your body. So it's your body image. It's your, it's your, the way you act, like you said, your, your confidence, uh, the persona that you give out and that comes from the inside. So you have to smile, you have to look confident, 
Um, I think it definitely helps to practice your posing, to know your body when you're up there. You know, when I interviewed Frank Zane, he said that when he was preparing for contest, he would have somebody, his wife would take pictures of him every week as he was preparing for the show. So he said, when you look in the mirror, you get a kind of a false image of yourself because you're seeing yourself backwards in a mirror. Mm -hmm. You're not really seeing the real you. So he said, most people who compete don't really know what they look like. They think they know what they look like, but they really don't know what they look like. So they have a little bit of insecurity when they get up there because they don't know what they look like. But he was taking so many pictures of himself and looking at the pictures that he knew exactly what he looked like. So when he went up there, he was very confident because he knew what he was presenting to the judges. So if you know if you're ready, then it's just a matter of presenting yourself right, hitting the poses correctly, and showing that confidence. And I've seen many contests, not just the ones I've competed in, but the ones where I was judging or watching as a spectator, I've seen it happen many times where there's a guy up there that should not win because he doesn't have the best body, but somehow he does win because he has the correct attitude. He presents himself the best way. And we've seen smaller guys do really well in the sport. Like Lee Labrada was 5'6", 176 pounds. Uh, Mohamed McAway was even smaller. He was 5'2", like 150 pounds, you know. Uh, but these guys would win professional contests because – the way they got up there and they presented themselves, they were they they made themselves look like winners, and that's an aspect of the sport that you can develop and and make yourself a winner. It's not just what you do in the gym. This isn't a meathead sport, despite what a lot of people think. You're not just training, grunting, and and developing these big muscles and then getting up there or just you know walking up there like a gorilla. You have to present yourself in a in a professional way, and the more professional you can show yourself, the better you're going to do. And we can see this even in big shows like the Mr. Olympia. Every, all those guys in the Mr. Olympia are the best physiques in the world, but the guys that make the top six are the ones that know how to present themselves in the best way. And they know their bodies, and they know how to present their bodies, and they also show that confidence. And this is something Arnold did very, very well. He was very charismatic, and he was very confident on stage. And his last contest, which was the 1980 Mr. Olympia, he was not at his best, he'll admit that, he only trained for eight weeks after being off for five years. So his strong points came up. His arms still looked good. His chest still looked good. He had the height. But he had a lot of weaknesses in his physique. And to, to this day, that, that contest is the most debated contest ever because yeah. I talked to people that were at the show, and they said when you saw him on stage, he looked like the winner. And then I talk, I, I remember, I'll never forget, I read this article in Iron Man, and this guy was a photographer, and he took all these pictures. I think it was like 800 pictures. So when he got home from the contest, he analyzed all the pictures. He said when he was watching the show, he thought Arnold was first. When he looked at the pictures, he had him an eighth. <laughs> 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 so that goes to show you the power of his charisma and his smile yeah. and how he presented himself. And he believed he was the winner. And when you believe you're the winner, then everyone else believes you're the winner. And if you don't believe you're the winner then other people are going to doubt, including the judges. They're going to doubt if you're a winner. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think there was a lot of that with uh, with Dorian Yates in the 90s yeah. and like Flex Wheeler and some of those guys who kind of, Dorian would come in after like a year, like training in his like, you know, rusty gym and like some yeah. dungeon in, uh, in England. Nobody had seen pictures of him. They'd be like, yeah black and white photos like leaked out, you know, six weeks out before con everyone was like, Oh my God, this guy's a massive, like he's yeah. added 20 pounds to his physique and he'd like win the show before he even stepped on stage because yeah. he'd take his shirt off and everyone's like, Holy crap. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, but he was also amazingly conditioned and like, yeah. so hard, like just, but yeah, that, that mental game is a, is a, I think we, I mean, it shows up in every sport, right? You still have to win. You still have to like make the basket or, or whatever, but it, the way that that draws the judge's eyes or, or yeah. psychs out the defense or, or whatever, like it, the mental competitiveness of, of like an Arnold or somebody like that can really affect the outcome of, of a sport or a game or something like that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, um, it happens in every sport, like you said. And if you look at guys like Muhammad Ali or in any sport, I mean, you have to be prepared mentally to win before you can win. But bodybuilding even more so, I think, because we're not doing any kind of physical contact. We're not pushing guys off the stage. It's not who's the strongest or who's the biggest. 
or who's the you know who runs the yeah. fastest or who knocks the other guy out we're just standing there by ourselves there's no contact and we're posing so we have to present that out to the judges and whatever right. you present out to the judges is what the, and i know because i was a judge and i could see this on stage i saw it many times i remember never, i'll never forget one time i was we were in the lobby of the high school and all the competitors were milling around and they were getting ready to check in and i looked at this one guy's face and he was so serious and i said wow that guy's gonna win the show and when he got up on stage he had the physique and he won the show <laughs> yeah it's like you could see the guys that are like at a different level of just yeah. like intensity like mental, concentration mental. yeah right because you can't you can't make up for the work like you right. can't fake the hours and hours and hours of in the gym plus the nutrition plus the like sacrifice like but that stuff develops confidence like yes. when you know yeah. Yeah. when you yeah. know you you're like i did every single thing i was supposed to do when i was supposed to do it i didn't cheat right. i showed up here exactly the way i expected to show up right. and you bring that as confidence to the show and yeah, yeah. especially in smaller shows i i would i, I remember i've gone to see a couple of shows here in austin and and just kind of notice that vibe. Like you can kind of, people are milling around. Like you say, you can kind of see the ones who are like there for the social aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And those who are just like, yeah. like they're like, they're wild animals, like ready to like attack yeah. the state, you know, or even so. if you go, if you go backstage, you could see it too. You know, when the guys are pumping yeah. up and stuff, I've never, the, the first show I ever won, which was that MPC Illinois state. Um, one of my training partners was back there with me and he was like, we were trying to kind of psych indirectly psych out everybody because he was like putting all this attention on me and he was with me the whole time. And he'd be like, go do this. Let's do this. Let's do these extensions. Go do some lateral raises. And he kept mm -hmm. me busy. So he goes, he goes, don't look at him. Don't look at him. Don't look at anybody. And then we were getting ready to go out and he's combing my hair. Like you gotta, you gotta get your hair right. <laughs> and everybody's looking at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> you had a hype man. You had yeah. a hype man there. So like, yeah, baby, you got like... this. What's up? What's up? Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> You're like, <sighs> well, man, John. I, I mean, we could just keep going and going and going. I, there's a whole other part of your life after after Mr. Uh, Mr. Natural Olympia we could talk about, but uh, yeah. I, I I want to honor your time too. So let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, right, but please. before we do, talk about the two podcasts you're a part of other ways people can uh can engage with you and then i'll share some stuff in the show notes too so links okay. and things yeah i do a, a show called bodybuilding legends so it's a podcast you can find it on any of your podcast streaming services and i also put it on my youtube channel which is under my name john hansen so uh, i tape it like you're taping this one here and i put it up as a youtube uh, video as well so uh yeah i try to do that every week usually sometimes uh, it's every other week but it's been consistent for the last five years so uh, and my website for that is bodybuildinglegendshow.com. And then I have just started another podcast about four months ago called the Muscle Maturity Podcast. And that's with Old School Labs, which is one of my sponsors. And I do that with Samir Banut, who is the 1983 Mr. Olympia, and Nick Trigilli. And so we just basically talk about all the topics that are going on in bodybuilding that week. And so that is on the Old School Labs uh, YouTube page. And that's on every week. Uh, usually like Tuesdays. Um, and then I have another website called uh, John Hansen Fitness where you can uh, buy my products or uh, get my services. And then I'm working with uh, Pro Physique. And Pro Physique is a uh, coaching service where we help uh, with training and nutrition, contest prep. And I'm one of their coaches. So if you're interested in hiring me, uh, like you, Barton, you can just go to uh, prophysique.com and just click on the coaches link and then you'll see my picture there. Yeah. And I can, I cannot recommend you enough. Oh, if that makes you. sense. Like I, it's, I, I've been working with John for about f four months, four or five months now since June yeah. and it's just been awesome. Very simple. The way you worked, the check-ins, all the communications, awesome. And results have been fantastic. I've, I've yeah. gotten stronger in the last four or five months and my, probably I don't think I've been this, I've, I've never been this strong in my life, which is a cool thing, yeah. but also just like the amount of strength I've, I've developed because of the habits and the, and the eating, all that kind of stuff has been kind of amazing in the last four or five months without any injuries at all. And so knock on wood, you know, <laughs> got about five months before my first show uh, yeah. in, in April. So yeah, couldn't recommend you anymore. It's just been an awesome experience with you. 
Well, thank you. Right back at you too, Bart, because it's great to work with someone like you who's so dedicated. You have a goal in mind. Um, you're sticking to the program. You're eating right. So it's so easy when I have a client like you, and it's fun working with somebody like you who's uh, dedicated and, and motivated and got a, like I said, you have a, a goal in mind of what you want to do. And it's fun watching you make your improvements. I'm, I'm right there with you while you're doing it. And I got, we got a chance to work out too at my gym and powerhouse, powerhouse that gym was, athletic club. So that was awesome. That was fun too. Yeah. I might have to come out there in like March and you can, you can like take me through a posing, like work on our posing oh, absolutely. at that I point. Cause that. Yeah. <laughs> that's another aspect of this whole thing that I'm a little yeah, like, Ooh, I got sure. at some point I better have a posing routine down. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, John. Thanks so much, man. Have a great day and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank okay. you, brother. Take care. I appreciate it, buddy.